Hey there! Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby-related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Flaschenberg, and I am your host of Yoga Birth Babies, and I wanted to offer a trigger warning that this conversation is going to be about pregnancy and infant loss, and I recognize that for some people going through that right now, this may be too much of a sensitive topic to listen to. For those that are listening, maybe you're supporting someone going through this, maybe you are going through this and you want to have that support, I'm really excited to share this conversation with you. Let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about riding the waves of grief and working through one's pain, one's suffering through this loss. We're going to talk about the importance of having these conversations about infant loss. And we're going to also talk about should you choose to have another pregnancy how to help yourself find confidence and work through the anxiety and nervousness of that. We're also going to talk about maybe you're the person that is supporting someone through this experience and how to do so, and also things maybe not to say. So to have this very important conversation, I have Devorah Enton. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She is a licensed clinical social worker specializing in reproductive and perinatal mental health with advanced training by post postpartum support International. She also has training through ASRM and the MISS Foundation in Compassionate Bereavement. Devora is a clinical consultant for Yesh Tikva, Jewish Infertility, and oh, we're going to really test how my Hebrew is, um, Nafayim <laughs> Pregnancy Loss, and is a lead trainer for Postpartum Support International, recently launching their Perinatal Loss Advanced Training. Devorah has a lot that she offers in this conversation, and she offers it with such humbleness and such groundedness. I think anyone listening will get a lot out of that. Now, before we jump into this conversation, I just want to touch base about what's happening at Prenatal Yoga Center. So as we head into our summer months, I know that a lot of folks travel, which is another reason that we've been keeping our online classes seven days a week. What's been really fun is I've had folks that take class in studio, and then all of a sudden they tune into one of our online classes. And I'm thinking, where are you? And they tell me where they're traveling to, or maybe a second house. And it's just really fun to see how the community can can stay together and expand at the same time. So we're committed to keeping our classes online seven days a week. And of course, we have all of our in-studio classes. We're also adding to our on-demand library, something I'm so proud of that I recognize our schedule and when we offer classes and and workshops may not fit with what you need. So that's why we have our on-demand library. You can check that out. It has pretty much all of our in-studio workshops and yoga classes. So you can please take a look at that. We've also made some changes to our prenatal yoga teacher training. So if you have been following along with us or you just have a passion for taking the work of working with the perinatal community to your community, you can check out our our teacher training. What we've changed to is that the early fall will be online. We had a lot of folks reach out saying they wanted to do the training and they just couldn't make it to New York twice in two months. So we took it online. And so now we have an early fall online, a late fall online, a winter online, and then back in person in the spring of 2024. Wow, that sounds so far away. And then of course we have our once a year postnatal teacher training that's online. So check all that out. Now before we get to the next conversation, I just want always want to say a big thank you. I want to say a thank you to 
our huge community. Whether you're listening, a listener for the podcast community, you're participating in our workshops or our classes in that community, our teacher training community, I just appreciate you. And I appreciate that you're showing up to be part of what we offer. And if you have a moment, I would be so appreciative if you could leave a rating and review wherever you're listening to this podcast or wherever you can rate and review us. It means a lot to me and it would be be very helpful for people to find us. All right, that is enough of me jabbering away. We're going to take a super quick break and when we come back, please enjoy my conversation with Devorah. Hey there. Did you know Bakers always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Bakers app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Bakers today. Bakers, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Hey there. Did you know Bakers always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Bakers app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Bakers today. Bakers, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Hi, Devorah. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to speak with you. So thank you. So I know we're going to dive into a topic that I guess I should do a trigger warning for some folks. This is going to be about pregnancy and infant loss. So it's going to be a big topic, I think. And I'm excited that you are so uh, prepared to talk about this because as I was getting these questions together, I felt overwhelmed by the topic. So um, I thank you for being so open and supportive for this. So absolutely. All right, let's just jump in. So I'd love to learn a little bit about you and what led you to focusing on reproductive and prenatal mental health. Sure. So I think that it's kind of like a, a pathway that some, somehow I, I was guided to be here. I, I would say that I was pre-med for many, many, many years before I became an adult um, and then took a little bit of a turn and decided to focus in on mental health rather than focusing physically on physical health. And then I feel like this is a blending of those two worlds. Mm. I've always been passionate about um, maternal health. And actually remember the moment where I learned that term maternal mental health, and it wasn't in school, it was way after. Mm. Um, and, you know, kind of the blending of maternal mental health, the introduction of perinatal mental health, the concept of reproductive mental health was almost like, wait a minute, this is exactly what I was supposed to be doing since I was a little girl. And I think like my comfort in the medical milieu kind of contributes to the, to the, um, to the depth of the work that I can do, because mm-hmm. I think that being within this world of maternal and reproductive health, a lot of this tends to be medical. Uh, and so like kind of the hybrid of medical and, and, uh, and mental health is we're exactly where I was. I landed exactly where I was supposed to be. Um, and love every minute of the work that I do. That's amazing. So your foundation is, if I'm correct, um, licensed clinical social worker, and then you went on to dive deeper or did Correct. you? Uh, re- okay. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I became a therapist and um, actually started out my career in macro level social work. So I really was doing quite a bit on education, on on reaching out to the communities and specifically the Orthodox Jewish community was a, a, a niche and practice of mine, a community in which I practice. And so that community tended to be my primary audience of making sure that we get good quality education out to the, um, to the people that I knew. And then that broadened into, Hey, why are we holding it just to this community? We all need to be talking about these important things. And so, uh, I would organize conferences and mental health education, and then of course, coordination of services. And then eventually that, that moved over into, Running support groups in in pregnancy loss um, exclusively by phone. We we I still do that many many years later. I do it at least once or twice a month, um, and we're reaching a lot of women that way in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, this happens to be a female only group, but it is astounding to see how much can be accomplished in a support a support and supportive space. 
And so uh, that became a private practice, which became a group private practice, which became, you know, a couple of the other things that I like to keep my fingers in, like teaching on a master's level, pro- in a master's level program, uh, and just trying to always be looking for new things that keep me fresh. Like I just recently completed my um, studies in in sex therapy and working oh, wow. towards my ASEC certification. So, you know, always looking to grow and to learn from the people around me. And it sounds like it was quite a natural, organic growth of your experience too. Agreed. Absolutely. All right. So let's dive into pregnancy and infant loss. So as I was thinking about this, I talked to some students about this. And one thing they said is a lot, I was surprised how many people shared about miscarriage, but I want to also go a little bit more about like infant loss, but I feel like people don't talk about this. It really like, it was kind of like a quiet, hushed conversation. Why do you think people don't talk about it? And what is the importance of why we do need to talk about this? So I think that everything comes back to stigma, which comes back to shame, which always is intertwined with guilt somewhere in the middle of those two things. And I think that, um, you know, when we have, I, I think a lot of it comes down to like ritual and social expectations. We know that when somebody buries a child or buries a parent, buries a sibling, a spouse, we know exactly what we're supposed to do in theory. Meaning we go to a funeral, we go visit afterwards, maybe I send flowers or a cake, maybe I, um, I, I send a card every once in a while. Like there's, there's very much a ritualized experience of, of grief relating to the burial of a person that has lived in this world. Mm-hmm. And then I think when we are unfortunately grieving the loss of, an inf- of a pregnancy loss, like an, a fetal loss, a, and I, I would even broaden that a little bit more into something like the embryo did not defrost properly. That's also an, mm. in, that's also perinatal loss or the transfer failed. I lost an embryo. And some of you might be saying like, well, that's a bit absurd. But for those people who are in this experience, this is so far, this is as far from absurd as it gets. Mm. And so I think these are, there's nuance in these kinds of losses. How far along was she in the pregnancy? How much went into getting pregnant with that baby? Is it a baby to her? Is it a fetus? Is it an embryo? Is it fetal tissue in the medical milieu, right? Like, what are we talking about? And therefore, when there's so much missing language around talking about these kinds of losses, so we just be quiet. We're just quiet and we don't talk about those things. Um, And I think there's always that sense of like, if I can't touch it, does it mean it it still existed? Mm. And obviously that doesn't quite apply when we have a stillbirth, a later term loss, anything from zero to 20 is considered miscarriage, 20 weeks of pregnancy, and then 20 to 40 is going to be considered um, a stillbirth. But when we have a stillbirth and there's a form of a child to see potentially, then that kind of changes the conversation a little bit. But even then there's so little ritual associated with a stillbirth. You know, there's still those that might tell you, just don't look, don't touch, put it away and move on to have another baby and then you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. And there still is a strong sentiment in there. Um, I would say even a little bit of a bias in the medical community of, I'd rather you have a procedure to end your pregnancy when the baby has died versus allowing you to birth the baby. Mm -hmm. Um, Because one, I have to schedule and one goes on your timeline and not mine as the medical provider. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's necessarily overt, but it's subtle in that like, we just have to get this done, get it over with and you'll be okay. And, And that's not true. Um, I just have to give an anecdotal moment. There was yeah. an article that was just printed in JAMA, in J-A-M-A, the, you know, the medical journal. And it was an excellently written article about management of early pregnancy loss. and gave all the medical components and not one word, nothing, not a single line about like, check in on her mental health, check in on their mental health, check in on the couple, the partner, the birthing person, like just check in. And there was nothing, 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 nothing. And that really speaks to the environment in which we um, kind of cultivate these perspectives on pregnancy and early infant loss as well. Yeah. Well, I want to jump, I always have questions I send to my guests, but I'm going to jump ahead of some things in case people are like, sure. wow, this is coming out of nowhere. But you mentioned about having the baby and still having ritual. So that made me think about still celebrating the life of the baby that died and acknowledging the loss. So what kind of ritual might somebody still want to do that they can, how am I going to say this? Maybe hold like on to. Yeah. Or, or memorialize. memorialize yeah. Or hold. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, this is one of those spaces where 
it doesn't teach us how to do this work in social work school. Like there's no book that we got in our training in how to do this well. It's only when you begin to work with people and begin to hear their stories and their experiences. And then you look for the books and you'll find it by written by, by bereaved parents. But I think a lot of it, you, you take taking the lead by the client or the patient or the person who is dealing with these difficult challenges. So um, but really encouraging that physical and tangible memorialization of something that you may or may not ev- may or you may have never gotten to touch. Yeah. So one example might be um, there are people that create like a pretty box, something I always encourage my clients to do, take a pretty box. You know, Michael's has those really pretty decorative boxes. You're always trying to figure out what to put in them, but like those pretty boxes and filling them with things that honor the pregnancy. So maybe it was the positive pregnancy test. You know, we all tend to keep our urine covered (laughs) sticks, but we do, right? We do. We have them in a box somewhere. Put that pregnancy test in that box. Maybe you got a card from that first visit to the doctor's office that told you when your next appointment was. Maybe you had an ultrasound photo. Put that in the box. Maybe you could journal some things. Maybe you drew something. Maybe there was some um, something that memorialized or honored that time in your life. Maybe there were leaves that were falling at the time of the baby's Mm. Um, pregnant, you know, the pregnancy announcement, what was going on during this time in your life that if you put it in the box, that when you open that box, it feels like you're connecting to something in memory that feels that you are honoring that experience because Mm. everybody has something that they can honor this experience with. For, For some, it's more open. It's more overt. It might be, um, I've seen people create little, like almost like an altar or something on their mantle, um, something in their closet, something that just says, this is my space in which I remember the baby or the pregnancy that I held. Mm -hmm. Um, but taking the lead, you know, kind of listening to what works best for each individual person. One will not work for every person. There's Mm -hmm. no, like, these are the rituals you need to do. But I think, um, I think as well as to to additionally really make sure that we are honoring the experience of um, on the yearly so that it's not just in the moments thereafter, but for many people, it's about honoring also the anniversary, the Mm -hmm. anniversary of that baby's either birth or death or both, like however that works out. But most importantly is saying like, this mattered. It wasn't just something that happened to me in the past and I'm supposed to forget, move on, get over it, right? Those are the languages that we tend to hear too too frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, and instead saying, actually this mattered and I want to honor why it mattered to me. Oh, and I then, love that. Right, that, and then putting yeah. that into play. Yeah, coming back to it mattered. And I love that you also talked about it didn't, you know, the, the transfer into embryo, like, honestly, I hadn't thought of that, you sure. know, and I love that you highlighted that because if someone's going down that path, the transfer in embryo could be, you know, a lot of hope on that. And then, and a lot that, of money. Can we also money. say how much money went into each of those embryos, <laughs> And right? a lot of time and effort. Yeah. And then all of this mattered and to honor all of that. Wow. That really, yeah. you, you, you took me by surprise and I really appreciate that. So sure. for those who have lost a baby and it could be an infant loss, it could be um, an embryo transfer, it could be early or late pregnancy, how might they ride the waves of grief and then find their way through that pain? Sure. So one thing I do, I do think it's necessary to differentiate between pregnancy or perinatal loss yeah. and the loss of an infant. And yes. the reason I differentiate between the two is one holds some kinds of memory that are more real and more tangible and more visual and others may have shared in those memories with them, mm-hmm. right? It was a, a, um, a, let's say, let's say a child who lives for several months and then dies for whatever reason, let's say SIDS, right? So there are several months of photos. There are several months of touching. There's a several months of feeding. There's several months of shared memory with family members. That's all missing when mm-hmm. you're dealing with a pregnancy or earlier loss. So, yes. uh, you know, I, I think we do need to differentiate between the two and, and the grief actually can look exactly the same or could look completely different. And a lot of what that means, Ma- what matters is how, like, what we're, what walked into the room with that person when they began to grieve. So, are they coming off of a lifetime of grief experiences? Did they lose a parent? Did they have a parent die young? Did they have multiple previous losses? Like, all of that is going to impact how a person grieves. But 
in terms of I, you use the exact words that I would choose, like riding, riding that wave of grief, right? And that it's not about getting over anything. It's about moving through, but also recognizing that it comes right with you, right? Like there's not, we don't leave something behind. What I might leave behind is some of the like the the brutal intensity of those immediate aftermath moments but i recognize that some of that brutal intensity intensity might show up for me in the future as well mm-hmm. i might leave behind the intensity of the constancy or or the constancy of the tears but i recognize that those tears are going to show up for me in the future again the 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 grief is just it's just not a linear experience you know it's right. one of the biggest mistakes when i hear somebody say to me let's talk about the stages of grief you know i want to go wait hold on back up there are no stages there are no stages of grief first of all though those stages were developed by elizabeth kubler ross but they were specific actually to the dying person her research was about the person who was dying not about the person who was surviving the person who died Mm-hmm. And yet it was kind of like stolen sort of, or like manipulated because it sounded good to fit for the grief community. But the, and, and she actually had, in the later years of her life was disappointed and said, I wish I had never created those things because they're not relevant to the grief experience. They're relevant to the person who's dying in terminal illness. Mm-hmm. But if we, you know, so if you reject that model completely of five stages or, or even a sixth stage, as David Kester likes to say, you know, you reject that entire model. And instead, can you look at this experience as one that will move and shift with time? That sometimes grief will be very large in the moment. Sometimes grief will be smaller in the moment. Sometimes it will feel very, very heavy, like to the bottom of the well. And sometimes it will feel like you're floating towards the top. Mm -hmm. And each person will experience that many different times over their life, not just in the immediate aftermath of the death, but over their lifetime, grief will morph and change and shift um, in, in how each person experiences that grief. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, when I thought about, I mean, we've all experienced some sort of grief in, through our lives. And when I thought about the loss of a, a child, which my heart goes to everyone that has had that, it definitely felt like the idea of waves, like the ups and downs, the big and little and, and going forward and back. Cause that's what waves do. They go sure. forward and then they kind of draw back into the sea. And that's what made me think of like, it's not linear. Sometimes we feel like, okay, I'm okay today. And like, then that wave draws back and you're like, I'm not okay the next day. Yeah. So I'm glad you appreciated that. Also, one of the things that I hear very often is that terminology of like, but I thought I was doing so well. And really helping people reorient to what does that mean and what does that look like and what was our expectation of what well was going to be. Mm -hmm. So well doesn't mean that I I never will feel this deep, difficult pain again. It just means that in this moment, it felt a little bit lighter. I felt like I was finally maybe reengaging in society in the way that I I used to, Mm -hmm. but even though the world looks completely different, Mm -hmm. right? But that it doesn't mean that I'll never feel those feelings again. Right. So you talked about family that may be supportive of the person that suffered the loss. So how to support, what are ways somebody can support someone who did go through a loss of a baby or pregnancy and feel free to differentiate between the two? Sure. I know they are different. Sure. Yeah. And I think what also makes some of the things different is going to be like, if there, for example, if the baby was named, Right. Mm-hmm. So if I'm talking to you about what you've been through and the baby had a name, I'm I should be using that name. And if the baby had, you know, if the, if if I if I am close with you and I might say to you, would you like to tell me what she looked like? Yeah. Um, and would you like, you know, and, and if if they're if I'm actually close with you, I might say, Do you have photos that you want to share with me? I would love to see them. And I'm talking about babies that have not never lived or lived for very brief moments of time. Yeah. Um, and it's, and that is obviously heightened for those that, and louder, I would say almost, for those that have grieved a child that has lived for longer periods of time, you know, offering to, would you like to show, I'd love to look at the pictures of your, of the, your, of your little one and, and using their name. Um, I think that the theme of, around support mm-hmm. is, will you remember me? And I'm not talking exclusively about the person that died. 
will you remember me? Will you remember that I am a bereaved parent? Will you remember that I lost a pregnancy baby, et cetera? Will you remember me once the ritualistic time has passed? Yeah. And by that, I mean like, you know, what's like socially acceptable space for me to be in a bereaved state? Will you still see me as a person that needs support, that appreciates your kindness and friendship, that is moderating your expectations of me, um, that I know you really want me to come to your baby shower, but I'm just not ready. And yes, I know it was a year ago that, that I lost my, you know, blank, uh, baby, infant, fetus, whatever. Like, can you respect that life is going to be different and our relationship is going to be different, but yeah. how to s- tangibly support people? I think it starts with showing up without expectation. So if I show up at your door and I'm knocking at your door and I'm asking you to answer your door and I say to you, hi, how are you? I've been thinking about, and I, and the person inside has to say, I'm okay, but they're really not okay. Right. They haven't stopped crying in 24 hours. They're really not. But there's this like, again, that social cultural expectation of I'm supposed to be okay. And when you ask me how I are, how, how are you? I'm supposed to say good. Right. And so showing up authentically means I show up for you without expectation of return. So if I'm bringing something to your door, a cup of coffee, a drink, uh, 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 not alcoholic preferably, but let's say, you know, a cup of coffee, a box of chocolates, dinner, I'm leaving it at your door. I'm knocking and I'm leaving. I'm texting you. Hey, it's going to be at your door at five o'clock. Go pick it up. I'm at the door. I'm leaving now. Bye. Love you. Right. Like, or can I also remember that in a few weeks time, I could still say, Hey, I'm going out to Trader Joe's. Can I pick up groceries for you? And just acknowledging that. There will always be these little spaces and moments of connection that say, I remember that you're going through a difficult time. Mm -hmm. And then of greatest importance to me, and I think of of tremendous value is always putting something on your schedule on your, you know, we, we have a lot of technology that can help in this way. Put it in your phone on a yearly reminder that says, this is the anniversary of the death of this baby, right? That this is the anniversary of the funeral. And then a few days before, as that comes up on your phone, Text her, call her. Hey, I just want to, you want to take a walk with me? I know that it's going to be about a year. I know the next couple of weeks are going to be especially hard. You want to take a walk? You want to go for coffee? Uh, Or just drop her a note, a card, something in writing that says you are remembered and your baby is remembered too. I think talking about honoring, remembering, and and then physically supporting. I'm doing a carpool. I'm picking up your kids. Don't worry about it. I got your carpool cover today. Just that the, 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 community of friendship is like surrounds them, whoever they are in grieving and in the bereavement process and the mourning process. Those are fantastic. Those are fantastic ideas. As you're listening, I'm like, she's such a good friend. Like I was thinking, <laughs> I'm like, that's what we all need. All right. So we're going to take a quick break, but let's also talk about things that people should not say to those yeah. who've suffered loss. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll cover that question. We'll be right back. Hey there! Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Okay, we are back. So you gave fantastic ways to show up, see the person, see their whole experience and be there to support. But there are definitely things that one should be mindful of not saying to those who have mm-hmm. suffered a loss. So let's hear some of that. Yeah. I mean, anything, you know, Brené Brown is one of my favorite people and she writes anything that starts with the word at least with the mm-hmm. words at least are not helpful. Well, at least it ended early. Well, at least, you know, if you, it may have been a sick baby. I'm sure that that's why the baby died in early pregnancy, or at least, you know, that you can get pregnant. These are all comments that we hear. Um, I would guard against and, and really strongly guard your guard, you know, kind of prevent any comment from coming out of your mouth around anything spiritual. Oh, God really, um, you know, he only takes the good ones or I'm sure God understood, you know, wouldn't give you anything more that you could handle or 
um, you know, there must be a bigger plan that we just don't understand. And those may be aligned to your spiritual or, or religious practice, but are not actually supportive in this moment. And unless you're a pastoral, you know, you're a pastoral provider, a rabbi, a, a minister, a priest, and they come to you for pastoral support, then maybe there's room in there for something much better than the lines I just said. Maybe there's room for, for spiritual or religious guidance, but not from our friends. Our friends, we need to be just in the space of empathy and compassion. But other thing, you know, anything that says that is, tr- but, but our brain naturally does that. You know, I'll never forget my grandfather passed away at 97. And we were blessed for, to have a beautiful relationship with him and many years of relationship with him. And I remember when a friend called me and I said, you know, okay, but we were so lucky. Thank God he lived to a ripe old age. And then I said, why am I not just allowing myself to be sad? I lost my grandfather. He was an important person in my life. Stop trying to make it better. And so I think when we allow the grief to exist and that we don't try to make it better, I don't have to silver lining anything that this person is experiencing. And being yeah. really cautious around not silver lining the, uh, the, the grief or the process that this person is going through. Those are the primary things that I would avoid at all costs. Yeah, I see that for people that had birth trauma that they'll say, and kind of like that at least, well, at least mm-hmm. mom and baby are okay, or the parent and sure. baby are okay. And yep. I'm like, okay, it's true. But, um, exactly. like, mm-hmm. but that doesn't take away the trauma that the person experienced mm-hmm. in birth. Or I've had people that will say they're, you know, somebody said to them, oh, you know, I had a cesarean and I really wanted a vaginal birth. Well, you can try next time. Like <laughs> all right. those things, right. they don't right. really honor. Again, I love what you you said like if you're starting with at least you probably shouldn't say that that is yeah. that's a good takeaway all right so say somebody has start has decided okay i want to go down this journey again of pregnancy or having a, a baby but they're very nervous of course if they've suffered loss what are some ways to help build confidence to restart this journey so that's like a kind of a loaded question because, and it's an important question. First and foremost is the acknowledgement that this is not going to be simple. There's no way for us to go through a loss like that and then trying again, try again without any level of anxiety or worry, right? It's yeah. just not possible. Yeah. You know, it's it's like, let me just help you revisit the trauma every single day for nine months and you'll be fine. That's really what we're asking of people. And, and there hasn't been much creative ways for us to get past those nine months. And good, you know, there really isn't availability in us saying, I'm going to skip this trauma completely, right? If I want a baby, I've got to try again. And I think it takes extraordinary courage, first of all, to try again. I think it takes the courage that goes very, very much unrecognized when somebody has to say, okay, I went through this. This was so painful. This was so devastating. And yet I'm willing to do this again. Um, and I think that, that as a starting point is acknowledging that piece that number one, it takes courage. And number two, it's going to be really hard. And number three, I I love that you said the word nervous, and I'm going to insert that word anxiety in there, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not possible to have a super calm, super kumbaya kind of pregnancy when I have, I'm coming off of a loss and for many of the women I work with, it's coming off of a preg- of multiple losses. And so you can imagine how difficult, how extraordinarily difficult it is for somebody who has had a recurrent loss to pick up and try again with the hopes that next time the outcome will be different. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that first and foremost is kind of setting a plan for yourself with your medical and your emotional support providers. So if you have a therapist, start working with that therapist to prepare for taking care of yourself during the attempt to conceive. And of course, during the pregnancy, if you have a history of mental health concerns, if you have a history of anxiety, history of depression, have that conversation really early. Like what would I need in order to maintain my health, both physically and emotionally? So just some like technical things, like, do I have a history of being on antidepressants? Do I want to make sure that I've discussed that with my physician? That if the anxiety is so high, I know what medication, anxiety, or de- I'm going to focus on anxiety because anxiety and depression tend to be kind of mixed a little bit together, but that, and the treatment is fairly similar actually. So do I have a plan in place for my medical providers that we have a plan in case my anxiety is so high that I'm not sleeping? Mm-hmm. Right. Or my anxiety is so high that I cannot get myself to work or I, I'm not taking care of myself in the way that I should be in a pregnancy. So I have a plan. 
Do I have a plan for good sleep habits? Do I know what I need and what kind of sleep I need to get? Because we know that sleep is so protective of both physical and emotional health. Um, and so I think like kind of thinking about with my physician, thinking or, or my whoever my birth provider is, right? My midwife, et cetera. Can I work with them to make a plan for attempting this process again? Then also focusing on my physical needs. Am I able to stay physically can I, can, can I get some movement? Can I, can I take a walk? Can I do yoga? Can I, um, can I take care of my body in the way that my body needs that kind of physical nourishment? And can I attend to myself from a nutritious nutrition perspective? Can I make sure that I have a plan to take care of myself nutritiously, even though from a nutritional perspective, even though I'm going to be very anxious. And then also when do I know that I need to reach out for more support? So if I am so anxious that I am not sleeping, not eating properly, kind of frozen in place, feeling a lot of um, my my mind is racing so quickly that I'm not able to get, you know, kind of concentrate or focus or it's disrupting my daily life, impacting the way that I'm functioning. We need you to reach out for, for really good, highly qualified support. And I'm going to just put like a good plug in there. People sure. should be aware of the term, a perinatal or reproductive psychiatrist. So we have psychiatrists that are excellent and amazing who really don't have much training or expertise in working with the pregnant or postpartum population. And unfortunately, what that means is that some psychiatrists are just not comfortable prescribing to a pregnant person. And they're more comfortable saying, go back to your OB. And your OBs go, I'm not trained in reproductive psychiatry. Go back to your psychiatrist. And so we kind of get this bounce back and forth. Things are improving, I must say. But then you have people who've done like either a fellowship program, it's not a board certification yet, but people who have extra training and like kind of an immersive, immersive experience from a training perspective in perinatal or reproductive mental health for psychiatrists. So a reproductive psychiatrist is going to be always my first choice. There's a lot of access to care limitations with that, but, you know, kind of reaching out to, to those that can guide you in how to find the experts that can support you properly through a pregnancy. That also made me start to think of, I know when we've had people in our community that have suffered loss, we always give them names of um, group support for, for loss. Um, what about, do you know if there are support groups for those that are going through a new pregnancy after suffering loss? Yes, there are. It's called either parenting after loss or pregnant after a loss. Um, I know that um, I know that Postpartum Support International has a group that is running, and several other like private groups will be running across the country. Um, I believe Return to Zero also has a group for pregnant after a loss. Those are two resources that I happen to be most familiar with. Um, but yes, because just being in that space and even that group may also even hold people who are saying, I am considering pregnancy after a loss, uh, because it just holds so much intensity, even to consider preparing for a next pregnancy. Yeah. I just, it makes me feel like we just need to support. So I had two miscarriages. One was very early. Well, they were both pretty early, but one, I thought I was kind of out of that. It was around 11 and a half weeks. I went in for my 12 week mm -hmm. ultrasound and there was no heartbeat. And I remember just, yeah. um, getting to that point with the neck when I finally was pregnant again, and just like holding my breath to that point and sure. really wishing I had someone to talk to about that, that was going through it with me besides, I'm mean, obviously my husband, but you know, we didn't have anyone besides each other to be like, okay, right. we're almost there. And in my mind, I just needed to get past that appointment, like that 12 week right. appointment. And then I felt like, okay, I could relax a little bit, but it just feels like having people that are going through it with you could just feel so grounding. Cause even friends and family with the best intentions, they may not have that same perspective. And they, again, we, we're talking about what not to say, you know, they may, right. they may right. slip into that. Right. Absolutely. And I mean, first of all, I also want to acknowledge what you just said, that you just ex shared that you experienced two pregnancy losses. And, you know, I think when we bring that into the light and we talk about our personal experiences, um, it, 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 it allows others to share their story too right? It, it gives a, it gives context to these kinds of conversation. And I know that by you sharing those kind of things that others will say, okay, this is something I can share and I can talk about. Mm. Um, I also would say that for not everyone does hitting that mark, that moment where I, I hit that 12 week mark and now I feel safer 
does it actually, oh, I know know, that's, yeah, right. And I I want to acknowledge that. Yeah. Like I want to acknowledge that, like, it's so complicated. So for some, it is like that. I just have to get past that, that 12 week or 13 or four, whatever that loss was. I just have to get past that. That's like a benchmark moment. And then we deal with those that kind of get actually caught by surprise where they're like, wait a minute, I hit the mark. I know like things are different than previous pregnancy, but I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Right. And so the anxiety stays right where it is. So there's some relief, but for others, there isn't. And I just, I want to normalize that yes. part of, you know, the, the, um, of that experience. Cause it, it can be both. It could be relief and it could be the same terror that existed before. And then also the, like kind of the, the confusion of why don't I feel differently? Like I thought by that, I would just hit 12 weeks and I'd be fine. And then I'm not. And that actually feels very distressing for people. Cause like, mm-hmm. I didn't, I kind of catches them by surprise. Um, but you're right. Being in a supportive group kind of helps people handhold so that they're not also not exclusively leaning on their partners, right? If you are lucky enough to have one. Uh, because if you are exclusively leaving, leaning on your partner, there may be some exhaustion in that for both of you. Um, and, and definitely depending on the dynamic in the marriage or the relationship, it could be very difficult for both of you. Mm-hmm. And so I think acknowledging that having support, having connection with others, having good resources available to you, um, could, could just make this a whole lot more, um, manageable, not easier, but more manageable. Is there anything else on this topic that I have not thought to ask that you feel is really important to share? Hmm. You know, one thing that comes to mind is that we tend to pathologize grief, right? As a culture, as a world, we pathologize grief. We make it out to be a dysfunction. Like we have to fix the grief and then we will all be okay again. Um, I think that especially with pregnancy loss, we we even more so tend to kind of just want people to get back to themselves more quickly. There's more tolerance for those that have lost a child or a living person, a person who's lived in this world, right? Like there's more tolerance for that kind of grief. And I think that um, one of the ways that we pathologize it is I have absolutely heard of physicians and, you know, even requests for antidepressants when they're walking out the door after their surgical procedure or after their birth. And it just makes no sense because medication is not going to make your grief go away. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, if you have a history of depression, anxiety before, and you've been on medication, continue on your medication, please don't change that. But if you have a hit and you have, or you have a history of depression, anxiety, trauma, whatever, like we really do also need to pay attention to that in a, in a little bit of a more highlighted kind of way in the aftermath of a loss. But I just want to be clear that we, we don't just prescribe medic. We shouldn't be prescribing medication for a grief experience. We, we need to feel this. We need to honor this. We need to actually have permission to do the grief stuff. And the grief stuff is the crying, it's the sadness, it's the reaching out to others, it's the isolation, it's the thinking about and talking about. That's the work of grief. Um, and if we close that off, or we think that we shouldn't do that, or we just take medication because it's maybe the medication will soften this a little bit for me, or maybe it'll numb me and I won't feel potentially, you know, everybody has their own experiences. We miss this very, very necessary component of bereavement. Um, and so while we might, this instinct might be like, get them some medication and they'll feel better. We we're not respecting the normal, normal developmental experience of grieving something that was important to us, something we loved and something we wanted. Yeah, and have it like you have to go through it in a sense. Can yeah. can you speak to one thing that popped in my head? So I had a student that went through like she was in labor and lost the baby during labor, and then yeah. it would turned. I know it's heartbreaking, and it turned into a lot of anger. I'm sure. guessing that's part of the grieving process is oh, sure. the anger and anger at the people involved. Can you speak a little bit to processing through the anger part instead? Because sure. it, it, I'm assuming it at some point went to sadness because I wasn't really close to that person, but mm-hmm. I remember her just explaining it as a lot of anger. Well, I, I heard a line and I, unfortunately, I can't remember who said it, but there was a great line of anger is a protest emotion. Think about that. Anger is a protest emotion. I don't want this. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be doing this. And I can only, I can't think of anything more, in, more, more of an initiator of rage or anger to losing something that I almost had, right? Like it was literally in, in my hands 
the baby was right there and I, and the baby died. And it's not the way the world is supposed to run. Like that's how the thought process is running. Um, I think to me in those moments of significant, it's, it's also, we have to label this one as a trauma, right? Babies don't usually buy, die at birth. It's a, it's a rare experience. It's devastating for the people going through it. It's actually also devastating for the providers. The medical providers are very often neglected in these spaces. And I've spoken to these doctors who are dealing with these and the nurses who are dealing with this exposure to extreme trauma. Like there's, and there's very limited support available for them because the expectation is you're just going to go back to work. But that is, this is a trauma exposure and a trauma experience. And let us not forget the partner that watched this whole thing happen. Mm -hmm. Um, And usually it's very messy and nobody's talking about it. Like no one's talking, I'm sorry, nobody's talking to the people who are going through it. They're not they're not communicating with the husband. They're not communicating with the mother-in-law who's in the room. Like there's, they're just immediately focused on, can we get this baby and can we save the baby and can we save the mom? So I just want to like, just acknowledging the traumatic exposure that is happening in that space. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, when it comes to anger, like if anger is a protest emotion and it makes sense to me that that's partially the initial response is how did I end up here? I don't want this. This is Mm -hmm. not what I want. Um, you know, it's no different than like a toddler kicking and screaming when I say you can't have that, this prize that I offered you. And I took it away at the last minute, like the fury of that child, that's instinctive emotion. Anger is part of grief and the anger can show up in many different ways. It can show up. And, and, but we, again, socioculturally, we don't like anger. Anger is like, you know, especially for women, we're not allowed to be angry in the way that men might be a little bit more culturally allowed to be angry. There's much data on written, you know, interesting research on that. Like we are told to not behave that way as women. Um, and so you can imagine that someone who has gone through this process may kind of have internalized that message of I'm not supposed to show my anger in public, right? And I sh- and, and yet they're exploding at all corners, right? They they need to express this fury and anger. Now we always have to be mindful of where does that anger go, right? Does do I turn it toward myself? Do I punish myself? Do I punish my body? Do I punish those around me? Right? Um, losing a baby, losing a child can be a pretty significant um a significant event that can cause divorce, that can cause separation. Many, many couples who experience child loss do not survive as in the relationship, even in the immediate aftermath and sometimes in the long term. Um, so we want to be just kind of looking at the broader picture of how can this person and this family find support and grief and and um, and trauma intervention for sure to, to navigate the anger and the sadness and the fury and the distress over their medical providers and maybe even forgiveness if needed to self and to others in the room. And, you know, I think that that's just kind of, that's therapy. That's what we do. It's, Mm -hmm. it's much more than a support group for sure. When we're dealing with moments of trauma. Mm, Thank you for that. Okay. We're going to take one more break. When we come back, what is one final tip or piece of advice you'd like to offer new and expectant parents? We'll be right back. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. So we are back. So I feel like after this big <laughs> conversation, I'm like, ooh, where, where is this, this going to go? So <laughs> one final tip or piece of advice, and you can draw on anything for mm. this. Wow. Okay. That's like a, again, big questions, big, <laughs> big, big questions. Okay. Advice on to anybody who's pregnant. I would say um, the one thing that I think we are not focusing on enough is number one, that it is hard. Even if it's something I want, even if it's something I dreamed of, even if it's something I worked really, really, really hard to get to, it doesn't mean it makes it easier. And I think sometimes when people struggle, it almost feels like they then lose permission to complain or to get help. Um, And I think that number one, it's okay that it's hard, meaning it's okay to acknowledge that it's really hard and to seek support from anybody that you can to help you navigate the hard stuff. 
But the main thing I want to identify in all of this is is actually sleep. Um, we just have so many studies and and emerging studies that are reflective of the importance of sleep. And if you think about it, what do we tell new parents? Like, don't worry about it. So you're not going to sleep forever. You won't sleep till they're 25, right? Like, ha ha ha. Isn't it funny that you're never going to sleep again? And it's not, we are, we are asking parents to do one of the most important and hardest jobs without any kind of intact cognitions, right? Like to just walk their way through some of these most complicated moments of feeding and taking care of a newborn who's completely helpless. And oh, by the way, you haven't slept in days. And I just, if there's, get creative. If there's anything you could do to protect your sleep, um, to take shifts, to take, to be, um, to, if somebody says, how can I help? Say, come over for an hour so I can t- take the baby out so I can nap. Like anything you could do to protect your sleep and to promote sleep um, for yourself and for your partner. And even if you say to me, well, but I'm the stay-at-home parent and the other person goes out to work, that doesn't mean you can do this without sleep. And so sleep as a measure of treatment, as well as a measure of protectiveness, um, especially especially if you have any kind of history of mental health concerns and emotional health history, um, that absolutely is one of those really holistic, uh, natural, <laughs> we all love that natural thing, but like, <laughs> it's a holistic way of taking care of ourselves and taking care of others. And if you're a friend listening to this, think about that instead of that baby blanket, can you come over and take care of that baby for a couple hours for the mom or the dad or the parents so that they can, they can catch a breath. They can, even if they just want to like lie down on the floor and cry, you can take the baby while they do that. <laughs> so, I, you know, just like thinking that. about how you can step in. I ask this question at the end of every conversation and I love, I think that's one of my favorite answers because personally sleep is my favorite pastime. If I can get a nap <laughs> in, like I am delighted when I shut my light off at night and curl into my little body pillow. Like that is my favorite time of day. So I'm one that totally. loves sleep. I put it on a pedestal. So I think that is truly an amazing answer. Where can people find your work? Sure. So my website, if you spell my name correctly, you'll find me. It's D-V-O-R-A-Enton.com. So DevoraEnton.com. There's actually like a media page on there that you can find bunches of, you know, wherever I've been, uh, I talk about perinatal mood disorders or pregnancy loss or just different kind of issues relating to parenthood. Um, I'm actually hoping to launch my own podcast within the next six months. So there'll be some wonderful conversations showing up there as well, but devoraenton.com. And thanks for that shout out. Of course. And if you want any podcast support, let me know. I've been doing this for, I think, seven years, eight years, something like that. I'm happy to share. (laughs) Well, this has been absolutely delightful. Thank you so much. You made a really difficult topic, um, except like easy, not going to say easy, but, um, digestible. And I think that's so important. So thank you. Thank you. Let's keep talking about the hard stuff. Yes. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details.